Welcome to the Portland Pentecostals podcast. We're happy you've decided to join us as we build a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Enjoy the message. Welcome to the house of the Lord. I'm so glad to be here worshiping with you. Thank you for letting us disconnect. We were so disconnected that when all that happened in the Middle East, we didn't even know what was going on. We went on a Holy Land tour, which was a cruise. And so we decided we're not getting an internet package or anything and just forget the world. Well, we did. And then we didn't know till Monday after it happened, they came over to the ship speaker and said, well, we won't be going to Israel. So we didn't go to our two stops in Israel. But we did get to see Ephesus and Crete and Cyprus, which are places where Paul walked. And uh, it's amazing to me that uh, many of the temples that they built, they never finished. Never finished. But I stood on Mars Hill where Paul stood and said, Him you worship ignorantly, declare I unto you, the one that made the heavens and the earth. And oh, how wonderful to know that God is still alive and he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, but he's right here in your heart, in my heart, through the power of the Holy Ghost. And that is so amazing that God would choose to live in our hearts. So today I'm going to be ministering out of the book of Exodus, chapter number 18. And it is my intention that at the end of this time, we would just celebrate what God has done for us. Sometimes I forget what I have when I'm looking at what I still want. I look out in the future and say, I'd sure like to have that. And I forget how much God has blessed me. I told my, uh, I've told my friends many times when I go home, I, I feel rich because I live in the kind of house that uh, I, my parents, we used to drive around and look at Christmas lights on Christmas Eve. And I'd say, I want a house like that. And, uh, and God has blessed me abundantly, but that's not just it. It's the relationships that I have with you and my family and the peace of mind that God has given me. And I, I don't have any guilt when I lay down at night. I'm not addicted to my anger and I'm, I'm not obsessed with fear. Uh, all of those things are gone out of my life. And sometimes I forget that when I'm looking at what I have not yet received. So we're reading about a time in the nation of Israel when they have exited Egypt and they're on their way to Canaan's land, but they're in the middle of the wilderness. So then they're in this unfriendly environment. And it gave me new perspective, even though we didn't go to Israel, we went to these places in Greece where uh, it, it doesn't rain. <laughs> and it was like, they were saying, we're going to go by the vineyards. And, you know, if we drive out toward McMinnville, we see all those vineyards with those nice rows of grapes. Their vineyards, they grow like this, and a, they put them around a basket. And they said, we make wine out of raisins. Because by the time they harvest their grapes, they're like raisins. They're not full like grapes like we have because they just don't have any rain. That's the kind of area that uh, the Jews were in or the Hebrews were in. They're in the wilderness and there's no water and there's no plant life. It's just rocky. It's an unfriendly environment. And sometimes the environment we're in feels unfriendly. Anybody feel that way, like you're in enemy land or and you're in crossfire and uh, the attitudes or the mindsets or the values you have, they're just not what the world is around us. So we read in Exodus 18 and 8, and Moses told his father-in-law all the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. So it's important that he tells, tells the whole story, not just how bad it was, but how God delivered them. Do you remember what God's done for you? Do you remember how he's delivered you? Where he's brought you from? I hope so. Then Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the very thing in which they behaved proudly was above them. 
Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and other sacrifices to offer to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before the Lord. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I'm going to talk to you today about the spirit of rejoicing or the ability to rejoice. The Bible says in one place, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice means to be happy again. It's not like the first time you rejoice. It's not like you're happy that something happened the first time, but you're being happy again. It's like celebrating your birthday or your anniversary. It's like, oh, we got married 45 years ago. We're rejoicing that we got married and we're still married. Or, or we're rejoicing. We don't just quit celebrating. It's a, it's a celebration. It's when we remember again the good things that God has done for us. It's not like, oh, we're reaching out for something and we don't yet have it. But we're reaching back and we're remembering what we already have. And in reflecting on the history of the people of God, we can see a pattern of God that he is able to deliver (coughs) and to bring his people to a better way of life. The story of the Hebrew people includes over 430 years of slavery just prior to this. And they left Egypt with wounded spirits and they were bruised and battered. They had none of their own possessions. They only had borrowed possessions. They had no ability to lead in confidence themselves. There was a fear of failure and a hopeless state of mind. They had no dignity and no respect of the nations. They were slaves. All that knew them could only remember their slavery. Could only remember their bondage. It's like your friends, they can only remember you as the addict. They can only remember you as the party animal that's always trying to get uh, something going somewhere so you can distract yourself uh, from what's happening in your life. And there are those that can only remember us before we knew Christ. And I want you to think just a minute today of what you were like before you knew Christ. I don't want you to go into all the sordid details. I I don't want you to think about all of the negativity, but I want you to think about how far you were from God. But I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ found me, that Jesus Christ found you, that he redeemed us, that he gave us his spirit to live inside of us. Through submission to Moses, God's man of the hour, and the miracle power of God, these people have found a renewal of relationship with God and a way out of darkness. They had found deliverance from slavery and hope of a future and freedom from their enemy. And that's where you and I are today, is God has extracted us from that horrible lifestyle. Remember looking for peace? And acting like you had it. Remember looking for joy. And of course you laughed. And and you enjoyed what you were doing. But in the heart it wasn't there. But oh when we found him in the power of the Holy Ghost. Remember that day when the Holy Ghost came and took residence up in your heart. Oh what a difference. That's a joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's a goodness that I don't. No, any other way I can explain it, but say it's a God goodness. And God came into my life. After they had crossed the Red Sea bed on that blustery night, they turned and watched in joyful terror and amazement as Pharaoh and the totality of the Egyptian army was swallowed in that same sea that had stood upright and they had passed through. And when they finally realized that they had been liberated and their enemies would never be able to enslave them again, they began to sing. And in in Exodus 15 and 1, it says, the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously and has the horse in his rider has he thrown into the sea. And I'm not going to read the rest of the song but they go on singing and singing like we do in the house of the Lord. There's power in the name of Jesus. 
There is hope in the name of Jesus. We sing those songs. Why? Because we know that's what we had is hope in him. And that's what brought us to this place of living that we're living in today. Oh, I'm so glad that I found Jesus. I'm so glad that you found Jesus. I want to celebrate what he has done in your life and in my life today. And then verse 20 says this of Exodus 15, And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. So they began to sing about what God had done for them. That's what we do when we sing about victory, when we sing about deliverance, when we sing about healing, when we sing about peace, when we sing about joy. We're singing about what God has done for us. I hope we never forget what the Lord has done for us. I don't want to forget where he brought me from. I don't want to forget what he saved me from. I don't want to forget what he protected me from. God is so good. It was time to rejoice with singing, dancing, and gladness. And I want to commend you when you come into the house of the Lord that you do sing and you do dance and you do rejoice with gladness because we need to do that. We need to respond to what God has already done for us. Yes, there's still heaven. And absolutely there are needs in our midst that are represented. We have needs of physical healing and provision. And we need jobs. And there's a lot of things that we think we need. But look at what God has already done. And if my heart can just be grateful for what he has already done, I will lift it up in praise to him. And when I lift it up in praise to him, he baptizes me fresh with his joy and his gladness. We all have a reason to be singing and dancing with gladness. Yeah, let me take you back to your dark day and then think about what you're thinking and where you're at right now. What a difference between your dark days and your days of light. I remember a guy, you know, there's the old saying, uh, um, the best day, worst day fishing is the best, better than the best day working. (laughs) There's a fisherman say that. I don't know about that. I'm not a fisherman. But I remember a guy named Rick Weeb that I pastored years ago, 40-some years ago. And I I remember him coming to church, and and he had a tough time in his life. His wife had left him for his brother, and and they both messed up the family. It was just, it was a mess. And I remember he's in the house of God, and I'm saying, how are you doing, Rick? And he says, well, my worst day living for God is better than my best day living for the devil. And that kind of became insane. And I thought, wow, this is awesome. Is that something's happening in the life of, of Rick Weeb. Or, and, and he's changed. Or Ron. Was, it was Ron. And God had changed his life. And he realized there was goodness and grace and kindness in the love of God. Have you ever rejoiced in what somebody else has? You know, we were in uh, Los Angeles one time and they had this tour and we didn't take it. It was, it was to go to Hollywood to spot people, you know. Oh, this is where that person lives. and Let's see if we can spot a Hollywood star of fame person. And uh, have you ever driven by and say, wow, I wish I had a car like that? Anybody ever said that? He goes, man, I like that car. You drive by a house and say, well, I'd like to live in a house like that. Or you're walking down the mall and say, that suit looks good. And, and then you do like me. You go into Nordstrom and say, I'm going to sue you for discrimination. You make suits for skinny young guys, not fat old guys like me. <laughs> so it looks good on the mannequin, but it's just a, uh, if the button popped, it'd probably knock you out. It's just like... But... We rejoice, and there are times when our friends have things, and we rejoice in what God has done for them, and that's the attitude that it happened. Moses and the Hebrews had been delivered from much, and they were now in a strange place finding out how to manage their freedom, and that's hard to do. When you've been a slave, you don't know what to do with your freedom. When you've been an addict, you don't know what to do because now 
you don't go back to that substance to give you relief. It's a different way of life. If it's a different way, <coughs> excuse me, of processing. So they were so focused on what they had not yet achieved that they were forgetting what they had achieved. They were on their way to the promised land. You and I are on our way to something grand. Yes, we have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. But guess what, folks? Especially as I see things happening that are happening in the Middle East, one day it's going to collapse. The governments of this world are going to collapse. There's going to be World War III, and there's going to be terror raining down, and there's going to be fear in this earth. But at the end of it, you and I will be caught up together to meet Him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Lord, and we will rule and reign with him. Yes, amen. It's not about here and now. It's about then and there. He's preparing us for that next life. He's preparing us for eternal life with him. Now, you and I look at little kids and we say, oh, they, wish, they can't wait to drive and they can't wait to get a job and they can't wait to, and, and then we get a job and we can't wait to retire and we can't wait to have somebody drive us around and, and you know, Life changes. But we see as adults what kids want. And we know when they get there, it's not all they thought it was going to be. But when we get to heaven, when we get to the place where God puts us and we rule and reign with him over the new heavens and the new earth, it's going to be exactly what we were built for. So Jethro comes along. A stranger comes in. You know what's really cool is when somebody hasn't seen somebody in a very long time and they see him again. Like Sister Elizabeth brought Daphne into the office uh, to pray. We pray before the church service in our office, all of us that are on the platform. And I said, man, she's gotten big. You know, just haven't seen her in a month and she's grown a little bit. And little kids grow pretty quick. Some of us grow pretty quick too, but it's just a little bit different and it's not as quite as noticeable. That's why we wear suit jackets or loose sweaters. So it feels really good. But... But what's interesting is when you have a family reunion and it's been four or five years and all the little kids that were knee high, now they're up here and people say, wow, you've grown. Wow, you've changed. I hope that when you and I run into people that we knew before we knew Jesus, that they see us and say, you've changed. And, and this is what was happening. It's Jethro, the last time he saw Moses, uh, Moses had taken his daughter and son and his grandchildren uh, and he'd gone to bring deliverance to the nation of Israel. He hadn't seen what God had done for them. He had only heard what Moses believed that God was going to do for them. And from a distance he walked up to the camp and he saw, what, two to six million people spread out. He saw this huge encampment and he saw what God had done for them. He was a shepherd, remember? Moses was his, his sheep keeper. He knew what it took to survive in the barren wilderness. And he was also a priest and his kids were there this was Moses father-in-law and he's seen the encampment and he can see the massive threat that this amount of people could be to a foreign nation and perhaps he's shocked at their ability to survive in this harsh environment and he begins to feel better about the man that he gave his daughter to marry and he takes it all in and he begins to rejoice for his family. And then he gives credit to God. And he lets Moses tell him everything that God did at the Red Sea and the crossing. And the, and the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. And, and the water out of the rock and the, and the bitter waters made sweet. And Jethro begins to rejoice at all that God has done for him. And then Israel begins to rejoice. Yes, you and I need to remember where Jesus brought us from. I'm not in darkness anymore. I don't fear that the authorities are going to catch up with me because I've faced all of my, my court dates and now I can move on. I've faced all of my failures and I've, I've, I've said I'm sorry to those that I've wronged and I've, I've forgiven those that have wronged me and now I have joy in my heart. This is how an unbeliever sees you and me when they see us. 
They say, wow, look what God has done in your life. Look where you're at. Some days you and I just need to remember where we came from and remember whose we are and where we're going. There is truly only one source of all the goodness that we have experienced today. One of the original chosen twelve by Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, the bishop of the church of Jerusalem, writes to the persecuted Christians that have been scattered abroad and factually stated in James chapter number 5 and verse number 1 and verse number 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variable, near the shadow of turning of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures my wife and I stood and saw all these temples we stood and watched we looked around Rome we walked for miles one day another day we took a golf cart tour and saw all these big ruins and that's exactly what they are men had built monuments to themselves but they are decaying but guess what the the God that walked terra firma in flesh named Jesus his temple is still alive because I am the temple of the living God And it caused me to rejoice. They live in darkness, but I live in light. And I walk in the light of his love. Oh, my intention today is to get us to celebrate what is rather than uh, grieve over what is not. God knows what's best for you and I. I don't, all of our personalities are different. I understand that. Some of us grieve, and we grieve for a long time. And some of us grieve, and it seems like we're, we're hard because we get over it quick. But we grieve differently than others. But I've realized, yes, all things work together for the good to them that love God and are they called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean it's all good, but he can make it work together for the good. That doesn't mean that it's all right that it happened, but God's going to make it all right in the end if we're submitted to him. Somehow he takes the brokenness and he heals it. Somehow he takes the wound and he soothes it and we become better for it there are examples of rejoicing in the scripture Abraham rejoiced when God brought victory over his enemy Israel led by Miriam rejoiced as we said when they crossed the Red Sea David rejoiced and danced before the ark of the Lord when it came back into Jerusalem Solomon rejoiced at the completion of the temple and Isaiah rejoiced greatly at the promise of the coming of the Messiah But I like Habakkuk. He said, I will rejoice no matter what. If there's no fruit on the vine, if there's no ox in the stall, it doesn't matter. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. Why? We're rejoicing in our relationship with him. I looked at my wife, my precious wife, and, and, you know, when Anthony and Erica went to Baltimore, I said, we could have Justin lived here. And you'd have to see it. It's a different world. When we were in Rome, we were walking through Rome and and, uh, walking through Venice and walking through all of these European cities. Thank God for America. But I I, I said, I could adjust and live here if this is where God called me to be. Because I have a relationship with her. And I said, as long as I'm with you, we could survive. We could adjust and we could make it. And that's the way it is with Jesus. As long as Jesus is in my heart. And I am in the center of his will. I can be anybody. I can live anywhere. Because Jesus is living inside of me. The wise men rejoiced when they saw where the Savior lay. Mary rejoiced when she was told that she would carry the Savior of the world. The Apostle Paul rejoiced that the gospel was preached to all nations. And John the Baptizer rejoiced at the first coming. And John the Revelator tells us that the heavens and the earth will rejoice at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Him. 
It's about Him. It's about our relationship with Him. It's about Him coming to live within our hearts. Uh, friends, we have reason to rejoice. Uh, yes, I know there's heartbreak in our lives. Uh, I remember when my father died, my mother died, either one of them. Uh, we went and we buried them uh, and then we went to the house of the Lord on Sunday uh, and we all worshiped as a family in the house of the Lord and said, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord because it doesn't matter who comes and goes as long as they are in Christ Jesus. It's going to be all right. And as long as I'm in Christ, I'm going to be all right. It's fine. I want to celebrate the good things that God has done for me. The prophet declares that the attitude that will be on the earth when the Savior comes, 1 Chronicles 16 and 31, let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar with its fullness. Let the field rejoice in all that is in it. The trees and the woods shall rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. The greatest cause that we have for rejoicing today is the gift of salvation. You and I have been freed from sin and addictions. We have the eternal separation from God has been banished. Eternal damnation is not our future. The fear of Satan, the fear of the past, the fear of the future, the fear of failure and hopelessness have been banished. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart through the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if the Holy Ghost is alive in my heart, that joy just pops up and it overwhelms all of the grief that there is in my living through the mercy of God and goodness of God we are able to live above sin live in righteousness declare the gospel to our generation and continue to live in freedom look at you guys look at one another go ahead look around we'd be a motley crew without Jesus wouldn't we what brings us together? Look at the diversity of the crowd that we're in. You know, uh, uh, recently, uh, Sister Cornell was saying, she said, it's not just the diversity of racial, but it's the business owners and the, and, and the laborers and, and, and it's the young and it's the old. That's the body of Christ. That's the church. That's the beauty of it. We have one another. What brings us together? It's salvation in the name of Jesus. It's the redemption that he has brought to you and I. And you are my family. I have a reason to rejoice. We rejoice in the God of a second chance. We rejoice in the God of salvation. We rejoice because we have a life free from fear. We have re rejoiced because we have the hope of life everlasting. And we rejoice in what God is doing through us in this generation. See, Jesus sees beyond the surface to the heart. Romans 12 and 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Later, Paul would write to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, Rejoice always. <laughs> Listen to what he said to the church at Philippi. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The Apostle Peter spoke to the early church of the kind of joyful relationship they had with Jesus in 1 Peter 1 and 8. Whom having not seen you love, though you now do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. We rejoice in a way that people don't understand. Why? Because we're going to have salvation of our souls. Not eternal damnation, but eternal salvation. Not eternal death, but eternal life. The healthy and God-ordained relationship includes the infilling of the Holy Ghost. We mention Romans 14 and 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it is peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is the kind of relationship you and I have with Jesus Christ today. 
Listen to Jesus, our example in Luke 10 and 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to the babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. So he was rejoicing in the revelation that people had of who he was. God in heaven rejoices. He gets happy again and again and again and again and again. I don't know about you, but there's things that I enjoy that I have received that it's not just a one and done. You, you can buy me ice cream and I enjoy it once, but you buy me something that I put on my body and I was like, I, I, this feels good. Even an old pair of shoes feels good. If they're the right pair of shoes. Even an old car feels great because it's, it fits you. It's, it's who you are. And, and uh, my last vehicle, I, uh, it's 16 years old. But I looked and looked and my wife, I drove my wife crazy because I looked for six months before I finally bought a vehicle. And it's like, oh man, are you going to look at another one again? Yeah. But when I made my choice, I knew that's what I wanted. And we looked for Jesus and we found him. And there's nobody else I want. I just want to be in relationship with him. Luke 15 says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God when over one sinner who repents. Today is a day to rejoice. And I, as I you stand, I would encourage you to let gladness fill this house. Let glory and praise and worship flow from your voices today. Jesus has called you out of slavery of sin. He separated us from our enemies. He washed us in the waters of baptism so that we don't have to fear our sins trailing around behind us. They're banished as far as Jesus is concerned. Yes, there may be a court document that says that you embezzled. Yes, there may be somebody in the world that said they cheated me once. Yes, there may be another individual that says they were not very nice to me, but Jesus washes away our sins and what really counts is one day we're going to stand before him and he's going to judge us but if we're covered by his blood then there's no more sin there's no more chance of condemnation he has become our salvation and we are on our way to a place of eternal inheritance he's fighting for us He's providing everything that we need. His mercy is on us. His guidance is our reality. And his joy is our strength. So what I'd like for you to do is pick three things that Jesus has done for you. And when you come to the front of this auditorium, I just want you to begin thanking Jesus for those three things that he's given you. Maybe if it's peace, say, God, thank you for your peace because I remember not having peace. I remember laying down at night uh, and I couldn't go to sleep or I remember waking up in the middle of the night in cold sweats uh, because I was fearful. Uh, I didn't have peace, uh, but now you've saturated me with that peace uh, and I thank you for that peace. So you understand what I'm trying to say? So express that to him uh, and then you, it may be a material thing that he has given to you. Maybe he gave you a, a sound mind so that you could have a good job and you know that peace gave you the ability to to treat others kindly and to treat others with mercy and gentleness and you weren't able to do that before because you didn't have peace and I want us to come together and I want us to just begin to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. Would you come please? Dear Jesus, we worship you. We celebrate you. I thank you God that you took the anger out of my life.